Hello and welcome to History 391. Today I want to talk about Asian Americans, or more precisely Vietnamese Americans, particularly emerging from the quote-unquote Vietnamese boat people phenomenon of the late 1970s going into the 1980s. The boat people idea was a really interesting one and there are these very kind of clear direction or connections rather between you know American foreign policy and and the existence of these new Vietnamese American communities that start to develop in the 70s and 80s. Certainly these weren't the first Vietnamese people who ever came over but for a couple of different reasons um, there's certainly a huge wave and a huge increase of these arrival of Vietnamese people as well as Cambodian people and Hmong and other various kinds of groups from Southeast Asia, Indochina and the rest. And I'll talk about how those two connect in just a moment. One could draw kind of a fairly direct line here, especially if you were critical of the Vietnam War, that this was American foreign policy, you know, coming home to roost. And there's a couple of reasons that um, the Vietnamese wave is kind of fairly large in the 70s and 80s. Um, one is the obvious one, which hope, I'm assuming you know, which is that the war was ending um, and that people wanted to get the heck out of Vietnam. And some of those people uh, were able to come to the U.S., fairly directly. Um, some were not. Many Vietnamese ended up in European countries or in other Southeast Asian countries or in Australia and things like this. But a, 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 you know, a reasonably sizable number um, ended up in the United States. Um, and the other reason, which is a bit more complicated and a bit more with a bit more historical background, is that there had only recently been major changes to American immigration policy that made it possible for these people. Um, to move in. Uh, you know, American immigration policy has a long history of being pretty complex and having very specific restrictions attached to groups that people are worried about. So, for example, at one point it was the Irish and the Italians and the Germans, but certainly in the last 150 years, Asian communities have, have kind of received specific scrutiny. Um, for example, the, the, you know, most famously the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, um, which was which theoretically meant you could come in if you were a Chinese labourer, um, but in practice basically meant you kind of couldn't come in. And this was extended and extended and extended into the 20th century. Um, the Immigration Act of 1924 and the Asian Exclusion Act um, of the same year, which restricted immigration to 3% of existing foreign-born nationals in the country which in practice was basically a ban, was basically a ban on, um, on people coming in. So only 3% in terms of numbers, only 3% of the existing foreign-born nationals in your country. So 3% of existing foreign-born Chinese in the country could come in per year. And if you've been blocking those people from coming in for the previous 40 years, it basically meant you couldn't get in. So the wording was not specific, we're banning Asians, but like the implication was very, very clear. So for example, the, the Immigration Act of 24, um, you know, being Irish and getting into America was a heck of a lot easier than being Chinese or later on being Vietnamese. And I'm talking about the Chinese so far because the Chinese were kind of, the, they were the main kind of immigration group that Americans were worried about, the white Americans were worried about, um, or non-Chinese Americans, I guess, non-Asian Americans were worried about in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, but there's all kinds of issues there. Um, there were assumptions about Chinese people being, you know, particularly difficult or, um, you know, assumptions about Chinese men being untrustworthy, assumptions about Chinese women, you know, assumptions that they were prostitutes unless they could prove beyond a shadow of a doubt they're already married to um, a Chinese man. There were lots of issues about miscegenation, the idea of people of different races coming together and having children together. Obviously, this was a major, major thing with black Americans and white Americans, um, but you also see it a lot with Asian Americans. And, 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 and it was, it was, in fact, it was the law only a few decades ago in the first half of the 20th century United States that if an American woman married a foreign born man, that she then lost her citizenship. Um, and that was just, that was an automatic thing that happened. So there are all these kind of functional reasons. And and many Americans, and I, I don't want to say every American because for simply it's just not true and generalizations wouldn't be kind, but there are definitely many Americans who either are unable to tell Chinese people and Vietnamese apart or don't really care. Um, and so this idea when Asian Americans are being targeted, they are being kind of targeted as a monolith and they're being treated as this one block. All this changes in 1965 with the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, which completely drops this national origins formula, completely drops the idea that there's quotas based on, on who's already in the country. Um, and there are some numerical restrictions remaining on immigration, but they're no longer tied to ethnicity. So, you know, it's not open borders per se that just anybody can come in, but what it does mean is they can no longer have policies that say, that, that in practice result in, let's say, you know, 
5,000 Irish people migrating in in 1966 and only 10 Vietnamese. Um, or at least if that were to happen, it wouldn't be because of policies that were effectively targeting at these different ethnic groups. The 1965 Act is a very, very important one. Um, uh, certainly in my field of Asian history and, and Asian American history, the 1965 Act would be seen as paired the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And of course, both acts are signed um, by President Lyndon Baines Johnson. So, um, and, and LBJ himself saw both acts as part of the same uh, process and as part of this kind of great society idea. There's this very kind of heavy moral component to this. So, so the 1965 Act is definitely kind of part of this, um, you know, it's part of a civil rights era and a civil rights movement. So it's possible for Vietnamese to come into the country in a way it hadn't been before. They are incentivized to do so, um, often by the, you know, mistreatment uh, at the hands or fear of mistreatment at the hands of Vietnamese communists coming south um, across, the, uh, across the parallel. Uh, once they get to the United States, they start to encounter many of the issues that other Asian American communities encounter, um, you know, assumptions about Asian Americans. So, for example, um, going back to the Korean War, there are certainly there. there it, it's not uncommon to see Asian American women who have a husband who had served in Asia. Perhaps they had met over there, um, or you know, had to have children in the country uh, here in the United States who are products of unions like that. Certainly in Vietnam, there were many, many children um, who were products of such unions who maybe were not legitimized or accepted by their fathers who just went back to the U.S. and that created problems for them back in, in Vietnam. So that was one major kind of um, motivation for people to, to, to leave Vietnam and try to come to the U.S. or to try and come to a, a Western country. Um, we have to be careful not to blindly or overconfidently think of America as better than other places, but at the same time, certainly if you're living in Saigon that's falling to the communists, you would much rather live in Arizona or Wyoming or certainly California. Um, and although I think that there's been a trend in the last 15 years correctly um, by Americans not to just assume that everything in America is the best, for example, you and I pay way more for our cell phone bills than we should. Uh, there's lots of ways um, in which the United States is hardly the quote unquote the best place in the world. But certainly in the 1970s, um, there were many economic kind of incentives. And what's kind of interesting uh, to move to the United States. And what's interesting too was the power of this kind of American dream idea. The idea that, you know, if you work hard, your children will do better than you and your family can improve itself over the generations. And this is something that Asian Americans have bought into for decades and decades at this point. Like the classic stereotypical example is the Chinese laundrette in major major American cities. And you know, doing laundry work, especially back in the early 20th century, 19, late 19th century, was just an enormous um, pain in the behind. It was just a horrible, horrible job that people didn't want to do. It was desperately difficult work, but it was steady, it was steady income. Um, and you could really start to build up some capital and develop a business that way. And certainly there were Chinese, Chinese people, Chinese entrepreneurs who did just that. Um, and there were lots of jobs that were like that. And so the Vietnamese Americans, uh, Vietnamese are coming in as they're becoming Vietnamese Americans and as their children are born as Vietnamese Americans, they're coming into this environment that has these kind of assumptions about Asian Americans. And that has, that has issues as well. So for example, um, the classic example of this is what you call the quote unquote model minority. The idea that Asians are better than other minorities, that they're not, um, I mean, depending on who you read or what kind of language people are using, that they're not asking for handouts. The idea that the model minority isn't like that, you know, they work hard and they do what it is and they participate in the American dream and they're fantastic. And the Vietnamese Americans kind of, you know, or at least many Vietnamese Americans kind of buy into this kind of an idea. Um, and kind of become a part of the um, American cultural fabric. I mean, how many of you like Vietnamese food? Um, how many of you, and if you haven't had Vietnamese food, you should eat some, particularly banh mi, the Vietnamese sandwich. It's awesome. Um, and in certainly parts of the country, like for example, Texas, which has taken a lot of immigrants for a long time, at least until recently, um, it's very, very common to have easy access to Vietnamese food um, in major cities and things like that. So there's all these different ways that, um, um, that the Vietnamese Americans kind of enter this kind of American cultural fabric. But certainly for during the boat people period, there's this clear connection to Vietnam, which is very hard for them to, to escape or to get past. And then once they graduate past those kind of immediate connections or even stigmas, if you want to call it that, now they're entering into the same problems that, you know, other Asian Americans have. So with that in mind, um, the reading for today on Moodle, I scanned some pages from a, a, a book of mine this is Major Problems in Asian American History, edited by Lon Kurashige and Alice Yang Murray. 
um, and um, it's a fantastic collection of primary sources. So I, I, I've put a few documents up there, um, not necessarily all specific to the Vietnamese, but I think getting to this Asian American idea. The discussion question today is based on one of these sources. It's Lang Nan, a first wave refugee, compares life in Vietnam and the United States. I'll mark it on Moodle so that it says discussion question beside it. So it's a very, very short source. And I want you to read that source, please. And I'd like to hear your response and your comments on how does Lang Nan how is she interacting with the American dream idea? And how, is it, how can we, how can we um, understand that in the context we've been talking about all semester? So for example, we've been talking about Vietnamese nationalism and Vietnamese ideas for a long time. What was the appeal of the Vietnamese nation? Well, I mean, why does anybody want their own country to express themselves and to prosper and to share their culture and their ideas and, and loves and everything else with other like-minded people? Lang Nan and many other Vietnamese felt this actually wasn't possible in the Vietnam that existed after 1976 when the country's formally unified and she seeks it in America. So, you know, why is she doing that? Thanks for watching.